This episode of The Startup Life is brought to you by People Ready. Startup Nation, you have a lot on your plate. The last thing you need to stress about is finding quality staff or the available work you need to be successful. Save time and headache by working with a trusted staffing partner that meets your everyday needs. People Ready is a national staffing provider with over 600 locations across the country and 30 plus years of experience serving people just like you. They specialize in a variety of industries including retail, manufacturing, logistics, general cleaning, hospitality, construction, and more. People Ready understands that you're busy and on the go. That's where their mobile app, JobStack, comes in. Use the app to place orders or find work 24-7 or wherever you are. And as social distancing continues to change the way we interact with customers, colleagues, and our everyday lives, JobStack provides the ability to find the right temporary workers or work you need while eliminating the amount of physical touch points needed in the staffing process. Visit PeopleReady.com forward slash Startup Life to learn more about how you can partner with People Ready. It's time to be about that life, the startup life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is the Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career minded professionals. You know, Startup Nation, today's content is very Awesome. You definitely don't want to miss out on it. But unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties and the first part of the audio, it got a bit corrupted. So we're going to go into this episode already in progress with today's guest, founder and CEO of Breakwater Studios, Ben Proudfoot. Enjoy Startup Nation. Ian King and Mrs. Doubtfire and Lawrence of Arabia on on VHS tape. Uh, I really wanted to be part of, of the world of putting on a show. Gotcha. And when I was a teenager, I got into doing sleight of hand magic. Uh, first, just kind of slowly doing card tricks for other kids in class. And then I got more and more into it. And I saw a, a magician down on the waterfront on, in the port, Halifax Harbor, mm-hmm. and named Patrick Drake. And okay. I convinced him to take me on as his student, which he reluctantly did. <laughs> And then we became great friends, and uh, that kind of set off a competitive uh, magic career. And I, I started competing uh, as a sleight of hand magician, and that took me to the international championships, uh, which I won when I was uh, seventeen. Right. And also to the the Magic Castle Junior program in Los Angeles, and and really started my my life as an entrepreneur. Got gotcha. you. Um, in that I had a, I had to to make money to fly myself to these different places. And uh, so I, I started my own business as a, a walk around sleight of hand magician at cocktail parties and birthday parties and weddings and stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of like my origin story. And then really a big turning point came for me when I was invited to go to a conference in Las Vegas. Right. Um, after I'd won the international championship. And which is kind of like the place that you're, you want to be if you want to be the best magician in the world. Of course. And I just did it. not like Las Vegas. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I just was like, I don't want to live here. And everything was kind of smaller than I had imagined it. Right. Um, and a little bit more smoky and, and uh, just, just didn't seem like the highest possible calling. Right. And I had made lots of little movies and things that I, uh, had a lot of fun with with my friends in in junior high and high school, mm-hmm. and I saw the video for USC Film School. Okay, and I said it just, you know, I think it occurred to me that that could be something that I could actually pursue as a career, and that set off a whole different path for me. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for sharing that, man. What is it about, you know, like, you know, sleight of hand and magic that just, just like super appealing to you even now. I'm just curious about that. I, I think for me personally, I'm a, I'm an intensely curious person. Mm. I want to know how things work, gotcha. and why things happen. Right. So my personal reaction to a magic trick that I don't understand is I need to know how that happened. Gotcha. I need to know, the method. And then that kind of paired with my desire to perform and interact with an audience was just this virtuous cycle of learning magic and creating presentations around it. And that 
really kept me invested. And then, of course, you get all this positive feedback from people. Of course. I was a pretty shy kid with a huge stage fright when I was a little kid. Right. And so being able to do something that elicited people's attention and their interest and that I could do that no one else could do. It's like a really great thing for a, a teenager who's shy or like struggles with those things to pour themselves into. Um, and so all those reasons that just really kind of clicked with me and started firing on all cylinders. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Ben, I, I want to ask you this, man, because like, look, you know, we, we know many, many a great filmmakers come out of, you know, USC. It's very prestigious film school, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Kind of talk about your experience about uh, there, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, my first experience was getting rejected from the film. School. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Let's hear that. I came to USC uh, undeclared. A very wise admissions counselor said, you better apply undeclared and to the film school because chances are you're not going to get in. Gotcha. And I had good grades and everything. So I got a scholarship to the university, which I needed because it was so expensive. Right. And uh, But I didn't get into the film school. So I came undeclared and kept applying over and over again to the production program which I never was accepted into. That's the hardest one to get into. Mm -hmm. And eventually I weaseled into the critical studies program, which is the theory program. Okay. uh, Which is essentially identical in the production program, with the exception of a couple um, classes where you produce short films. Right. And um, so that was my experience. So I, I really, um, you know, film school is, is, you know, 25% education, 75% networking. Mm. I, I read that the other day. I was like, that's very true. Um, I think part of the reason that it's so prestigious is certainly that it's so moneyed with George Lucas and all these people donating hundreds of millions of dollars for all the best equipment. Right. And it creates a group of people who are passionate and want to dedicate their lives to learning the craft of filmmaking. Um, but that's certainly not exclusive to USC. Um, Got you. And most of my education, frankly, came as a result of my being there, but not as a direct initiative of, of the university's work. So it's it's a holistic thing, you gotcha. know, and you kind of get out of it what you put into it, to be honest. For sure. Now, that, that makes complete sense. And, and, and I definitely understand, you know, like, you know, like you said, people pouring money into it and, and stuff like that. And also, I mean, location. I mean, you're right there in basically Hollywood, you know, L.A. and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So yeah. I definitely yeah, uh, that can't uh, be. the networking and stuff like that. Let me ask you this really quickly before we transition. You know, coming from that film school and having such, you know, amazing alumnus that come from that film school, do you ever feel any pressure from that a little bit? No. No? Okay. Okay. Fair enough. No, I I actually, I actually, I feel more pressure from, like, my family and my friends that uh, support, have supported me through this whole journey when I didn't have anything to show for it. Mm, And Gotcha. uh, Just was a was a mouth talking about it. Right. Um, I feel, I feel a lot of responsibility to them. My responsibilities to the university, you know, my bills are paid there. <laughs> Fair enough. I think I, I, I have, I have more of a responsibility to the next generation of filmmakers than to the university itself. Um, and, and, and my commitment to the university would, would only be to, to help, help future generations of students, um, you know, get get their break and and get the right education gotcha but no, uh, i don't feel i don't feel pressure tell me a little bit about you know breakwater studios I, I actually had the privilege of watching some of your films man and i have to admit you're pretty dope at what you do brother I have to, <laughs> I, you're pretty dope at what you do i, I appreciate you saying that. no Thanks. worries i i checked out the uh the uh some of the ones from the almost famous series fascinating yeah. stuff fascinating stuff uh, man yeah there's a great great people for sure for sure so just tell me about breakwater studios and, and why is it called breakwater and, and, and the, uh, the philosophy behind what you do there sure yeah so so well i can connect it back to usc so when i was Absolutely. at usc they were they were just rebuilding the film school and when i got there it was just in the final stages of constructing this huge new uh i think it, i think it's a 350 million dollar complex that George Lucas had like committed $175 million to right. rebuilding the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, uh, it belongs in Beverly Hills. It's very nice, this building. And I remember 
them like lifting these engraved stones up in the building that said George Lucas's name and Steven Spielberg's name. And I just didn't know anything about them and Got their you. careers. And I just became voracious. I became a sponge for how George Lucas built Lucasfilm, for how Steven Spielberg built his career. And of course, that led me back in time to, you know, Francis Ford Coppola, which right. led me back to the studio system, which led me back to, you know, the very origins of how, where the studio system comes from, how it originally was. And, and I really became obsessed by the idea of, of working on a creative campus where all the creative departments were together sort of on in one space or in one building. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really inspired by George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola, what they had, what they were trying to create with American Zoetrope, which was the failed sort of the idea of it was failed. Some, some version of it now exists under Francis Ford Coppola, but their vision of it at the time was a new, new kind of studio. Um, and they, it's, it was an unfinished dream. And so I picked up on that and I picked up on what was good, I thought, about the early studio system. Mm-hmm. And I decided to create a company that had those values that were shaped that way. And that was Breakwater. And so we started the company with that idea that the, if your goal is to make the best possible movies, step one was creating the right environment and structure and workflow for that to happen. In. And that was a place where filmmakers of all the different crafts and art forms and backgrounds and perspective could work in proximity together um that was the that that is uh, and was the core idea of the company got you and i called it breakwater Mm -hmm. because and it's it only is a story that grows in meaning for me um because my dad uh, just passed away Mm, sorry my dad and i thanks yeah my my dad and i when i was like 10 12 years old um, we, our family has a little, uh, cottage on the South shore of Nova Scotia mm-hmm. and we built mostly him with me helping a breakwater and a hundred foot, uh, wharf out of railway ties. And we, he, he sort of figured out how to do it himself and took cues from the locals and whatever. Anyway, we spent all summer and built this thing and he, we got help from our family and friends and. And it, it wasn't too pretty, but it was really sturdy. Mm. And um, uh, then our neighbors kind of got this same idea and they and they built uh, wharfs and breakwaters of, of their own professionally. They had hired, they hired people to do it. Right. And um, this next winter, there was a big ice storm and everybody else's wharf and, and ramp and stuff were all twisted and, um, you know, broken and collapsed. And ours stood strong. That, mm. that first winter and um that always stuck out to me as as poignant uh, gotcha. even though it wasn't quote unquote professionally built we we put a lot of love and care into it of course and we did it ourselves right and you know the word breakwater it's a protector from the ocean and right. i i thought that there ought to be a company in hollywood that rather than exploiting the people inside was a protectorate for the artists and for the movies where um, we can make things together and work to make a positive and supportive uh, place for creators rather than one that's just designed to make money alone. I hear that. I hear that. Thank you for sharing it. And thank you for that transparent and sharing me, uh, sharing with us uh, that story with you and your dad. I appreciate that. And once again, my condolences, my man. Thanks. No worries. No worries. Once again, Startup Nation, we're talking to uh, Ben Proudfoot, the founder of Breakwater Studios. I want to ask you this, man, from a content creation standpoint, because you talked about earlier about how when it came to your experience as a magician and stuff like that, that curiosity was was really big for you. Is, is that that curiosity still kind of play a role in why you do like, let's say, like the short form documentarian films as opposed to like these big feature films and stuff like that? Is that curiosity piece? Uh, what drives that and drove that decision to make that type of content? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for sure. I think mm-hmm. the fire of curiosity uh, is at the heart of almost everything we do. Fair enough. Um, especially in the selection of stories, mm-hmm. right? You you hear a story, or you read an article, or somebody tells you something, or you watch a piece of, of film, and just certain stories grab your curiosity, and you, you kind of say, you know, what happened there? Like, 
right. or, or you say, why hasn't this story been told before? Or right. you say, you know, why has everybody been telling it this way? What about this way? And you sort of, my experience of it is like, a, it's like an itch that you mm. just have to scratch. Right. And the, the only way to scratch the itch is to make the movie. That's the only thing <laughs> right. for me that does it. Um, and, you know, as the company evolved, the definition of movie was not a scripted feature film, at least not initially. Right. It was documentary. And I had made a short documentary in school called Ink and Paper, and it had sort of gone a little bit viral on Vimeo. Gotcha. And that was the first time I had gotten kind of a, a large audience response to one of my films. And that set off this entire course of, of making short documentaries, which I kind of uh, discovered was this whole medium that had really been underappreciated, underfunded, that, where there was really no economy around creating this kind of work. Um, but as time went on, I, I began to understand how powerful and important it could be um, and figured out a way to get it paid for by partnering with uh, brands right. uh, to do it. Right, which which sort of takes us into the present day and how our current business model works. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask about that. So, kind of talk to me about like you know coming up with that business model. I mean, obviously it's working out for you, but but kind of talk about coming up with that business model and what does that pitch sound like in those meetings? Well, I, to be honest, I didn't really come up with it. Okay, um, I knew, or at least deciding to come with that direct, go in that direction at least, right? Yeah, I mean, I knew that. I knew that I didn't have a big treasure. Like there's, there's only a few ways to pay for movies, right? right? You either have a big treasure chest of money that you got from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then you spend that to make a movie. <laughs> right. Of course. Um, you have a distributor who has a way of collecting money from huge audience and they're commissioning a piece that they want to feed the audience. Mm -hmm. Or there's some other backdoor way that you're able to align interests and get a thing funded. Um, and I wasn't into advertising, but really my first client was, uh, Kirsten, uh, Falk and Charles Schwab. Mm -hmm. And we did a project together and she was on the communications team there. And she was really the first one that explained to me that there was really a way for independent filmmakers like myself to work directly with brands where I would get to tell the stories that I wanted to tell anyway. And that could be beneficial enough to a brand that they would pay for it. Gotcha. And that was a head scratcher to me when I first heard it. But really, now that I have the benefit of 10 years looking back, you know, where we are in time is, a, is a, an era where traditional forms of advertising are extremely expensive and no one's paying attention to them. And so short documentaries have become a way for uh, large companies to speak to their audience in a way that they want to hear from them. Uh, and it's also a way to save money. It's not, you know, a, a short documentary is not nearly as expensive as the 60 second advertisements that agencies have been selling to companies for years. And that um, efficiency and if something's cheaper and it's better, that's the way the industry goes. And so we're just now at the nascent stages of companies starting to figure that out. There's a lot of education that needs to happen uh, to continue moving that needle. When it comes to creating content and, and selling the story and, and sharing the story, what are some of those things content creators should keep in mind? Because as we are in these unsettling times, we, we need great content to kind of sell the story of our business, sell the story of what we're trying to do to our customers or uh, brands and stuff like that. Kind of share your thought process when it comes to creating content. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I take exception to the word content. Okay. I'm sorry. My apologies. My apologies. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to apologize. <laughs> I think, I think it's pretty, it's pretty um, ubiquitous term, but, okay. but you know, the reason why I say that Dominic is because, I think the word content belittles um, mm. what is actually there when it's good, gotcha. which is art. Fair right? enough. I think that's kind of one of the bigger, the bigger things that people have to realize. It's not about content creation. It's about storytelling. Mm. And, and really, I think the thing is, is that our world and uh, the, our, who we are as a society 
it, are infinitely more media literate than they were just five years ago or 10 years ago, um, especially millennials and, and Gen Z. We are extremely literate. We understand editing. We understand cinematography. If you think about it like food, it's like, you know, people have a taste for what makes good food. They're not going to be fooled by, you know, jazzing something up with, with MSG and whatever. Right. It actually has to be good. Of course. <laughs> and, of course. you know, I think a lot of, a lot of brands and, and um, you know, entertainment companies are struggling with this because people aren't going to fall for crap anymore. Right. And, um, and the other thing is people also are realizing more and more that businesses are run by people that's true and those people those people believe things and as much as possible it's not really a requirement of our generation but as much as possible we want to support businesses that we agree with what they believe right and we support what they believe we don't want to support a company or a person that we don't believe what you know and what they're doing and so that combined with this really high sensitivity to, to bullshit, frankly, right. is creating an environment where brands are kind of uh, can, can go one of three ways. They can either say what they believe in, right? Poster child of that is like Nike. Right. Be consistent about it. Be, mm -hmm. be loud and bold about it. Right. And put their money where their mouth is. Although Nike is not perfect in any, right. in any way. Of course. They can make something that is so bland that it could not offend anyone. That's what most companies do. Mm. It is so bland and with and safe and without opinion that nobody can really really criticize it and frankly nobody cares or pays attention. That's what most companies do. Got you. And then you have a, a really dangerous category which informs a lot of people's decisions, which is where the company steps out and tries to be bold. But people people call bullshit and say this this is clearly pandering or not in line with X Y Z that you say you're you're a hypocrite basically. Mm. And I think the fear of becoming you know the the Kardashian Pepsi ad uh, right. puts a lot of companies in that sort of like safe, boring, milk toast category of not really saying anything at all. Right. The challenge is is that over time the companies that uh, keep making mistakes will lose their audience. The companies that don't say anything will lose the audience. And the companies that are consistent, clear, and bold about who they are will continue to gain a following. And, you know, that's, that's where companies need to go is they need to understand that they need to be clear about who they are and what kind of stories they want to tell uh, because that eventually will be the survival of the fittest. The people, the company with the best story wins. The company with the most authentic statement about who they are, with the most consistent mission, right. is the most admired company. Right. And we're already there, but companies haven't figured it out yet. For sure, for sure. You know, and, and I appreciate you sharing that because we're seeing a lot of companies, especially uh, now with you know a little bit of like you know social unrest with you know uh, with uh, police brutality and stuff like that. We're seeing a lot of brands that really kind of kind of step out there and and make you know what they believe in heard and stuff like that. Some that you know we really didn't even expect, like you know like a NASCAR, uh, if you will, when it comes to racism and stuff like that. So I definitely understand what you're saying and appreciate what you said for sure, Ben. Yeah, and I think I think really it comes back to a real fundamental question. Mm -hmm which is what is the purpose of a company? Right. Right. And, you know, I'm not, this is a, this is a discourse that's been going on for a long time. Right. But I remember, you know, when I first started the company and took on investors and, and learned about what a limited liability company was. And I understood the concept of fiduciary duty. Right. Where not only is it a desirable thing to, to make money when you own a company, it's actually the law. Right. Right. The law of the land is that as a officer of a company, it is your fiduciary duty to make decisions to make the company, especially when it has shareholders, mm -hmm. as much money as humanly possible. Right. And that's kind of the way that most companies, especially publicly traded companies, have been operating. And I think what we're seeing over time is a shift to 
companies really understanding their value, not just in terms of, of shareholder return, but also social value. And what does that company do for our society? And that may be companies in that they are collections of people have some responsibilities beyond simply making as much money as possible and that we can avoid some of the you know, detrimental effects of um, profit-focused companies on our society by changing the way we think about what the point of the company is in the first place. All right, Startup Nation, so we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. we got to pay some bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson, and you're listening to The Startup Life. This fresh coat of the startup life has been sprayed on nice and smooth by Wagner and the Flexo series of paint sprayers. Startup Nation, my wife decided she wanted to rehab her childhood home. The goal was to fix it up and invite a nice family to rent it out. We knew one of the biggest jobs we had to undertake was painting. However, from the walls, the cabinets, and even the siding outside, it was going to be a big task. As entrepreneurs with a company to run, we knew this was going to take up a lot of our time which is why we decided to get a paint sprayer. And after much research, we decided to go with the sprayer from the Flexio series from Wagner. Startup Nation, these sprayers are top notch because of its flexibility to paint or stain walls, furniture, cabinets, and more. It's 10 times faster than using a paintbrush, which was a big selling point for us. And you can paint or stain right from the can. It's also easy to clean in five minutes and being great for indoor and outdoor projects, a paint sprayer from the Flexio series clearly needs to be part of the arsenal in your garage. So if you're ready to stain your deck or like me, feel your daughter's request of a bubblegum pink room, up your game with a paint sprayer from the Flexio series by Wagner. Take it from me, your time will thank you. This episode is sponsored by Swanson Health. Startup Nation, Swanson Health has been producing quality vitamins and supplements, foods, healthy home, and self-care products for over 50 years, since 1969, from the heart of America. Swanson Health carries over 20,000 wellness products at a great value. Pick up all of your favorite health products, plus discover new ones for your wellness routine, all while leaving money in your pocket. If you want to try any of Swanson Health's great products for yourself, use code STARTUP20 for 20% off at swanson.com. We have a link there in the show notes if you listen to the replay. This episode of The Startup Life is powered by Colony Spark. Startup Nation, with our economy in flux, there is a lot of mixed messaging out there. If there was ever a time to take control of the narrative and let your customers know that you're here to serve them, it's now. And that's why you have a friend in Colony Spark. Colony Spark is an omni-channel marketing agency that believes in the power of community to ignite your business. They have helped companies across many industries with lead generation, revenue growth, and more to put them on the path to success. My guy Bill Murphy and his team are very good at what they do. How do I know this? Because not many SEO companies have the stamp of approval of being partnered with Google. Yes, that Google. So I want you to go to www colonyspark.com forward slash startup to schedule a meeting today. In that meeting, you will review your current marketing activity, receive actionable advice on how to pivot and grow, and ask any marketing questions you may have on navigating over the next few months. Look, Startup Nation, I know things may seem uncertain right now, but if you are looking for a business partner that can help light the way, go with Colony Spark, where they firmly believe in business helping business. All right, Startup Nation, welcome back as we continue our conversation with today's guest here on The Startup Life. It's funny you mention that and, you know, by you being on the show and what you do, because we recently had Dr. Bobby Parmar. He's a he's a uh, prof- uh, professor at the University of Virginia, but he's also the producer of a document uh, document uh, documentary. Sorry, uh, efficient with dynamite that talks about that shift that you're talking about to go from, you know, just primarily fiduciary standpoint, but also uh uh you know no taking in account other stakeholders like the customer and employees and the vendors that that company works with so i definitely appreciate you sharing that yeah because you know there's a lot of stress and pressure absolutely in these ceo and coo and cfo roles right and and frankly you know you have some visionaries and some leaders in there but people are just basically trying not to screw up 
Right. And they want to do what their job description says. And if their job description says make decisions that make the money, the company as much money as possible, that's what they're going to do. Right. And if you change that and you say, actually, sure, you know, it's, it, you need, you need to make decisions that keep the company alive and, you know, keep people, keep the company successful and in profit. But you also have a double bottom line that also looks at social value. Mm -hmm. They're going to do that too. Right. So it's just about, it's about changing what we're telling business leaders, what the point is. And I think you're starting to see a, cons a consensus amongst many leaders in that let's, let's see if, you know, they, they put their money where their mouth is, but um, at least at present, we're seeing a lot of companies uh, giving, giving voice to that idea, but only time will tell if that will be a consistent ongoing theme or just, you know, saying what people want to hear. I know that a lot of people, Hollywood and TV and film and, and in that space, you know, they've had to shut down production on things and, and things, you know, haven't been, you know, uh, so great due to COVID and stuff like that. But, uh, but what you do has been kind of thriving a little bit, you know, you've been kind of, you know, uh, staying afloat and stuff like that. You know, I, I guess I want to ask, you know, why has that been successful for you during these turbulent times? Well, I, I think we have a great team. Okay. Um, and you know, I think, I think it's a really fascinating time because, you know, normally in, in normal life, everybody has all these different problems. Right. Right. Oh, somebody has a cash flow problem. Oh, you know, somebody, you know, they didn't get enough business this year or, oh, they had a marketing flop or whatever. They had a bad leader. But right. now everybody's number one problem is the same. Right. Right. Everyone's number one problem is the pandemic. Right. And so what you're really seeing is you're really seeing how teams all these different teams, all these different companies are responding to the same number one problem. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the, the most successful people and the most successful companies aren't the people who have the fewest problems. They are the people that deal with the problems in the best way. And I'm just very proud to be part of a team of optimistic can do people who you know, looked at the, the problem that we have of, of a global pandemic and figured out a way to continue doing business and shift from being just an artistic company to also being a safety critical company um, gotcha. and not sacrificing the core values of our business. I want to ask your opinion on something because, you know, you make you know, like the short form documentaries and stuff like that. And I know just recently uh, the, the streaming service Quibi was was just yeah. released and stuff like that where they kind of do that you know uh like short form type of storytelling not content storytelling uh make sure i get that in there uh but you know they've yeah. kind of you know uh, capitalized on that you know I, I guess i'm curious about what do you think about about quibi why short form documentaries you know work so well or short form stories work so well is it because of social media because you can like kind of put those in social media because i know a lot of people watch videos about like that that 10 15 20 minute uh length on social media is you know what's the what's the success you think uh as to that why that is if you don't mind me asking well i mean no no offense to quibi but i don't i don't think we have a lot of success there Okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, Fair I, think, I think clearly they were very successful in raising a huge amount oh, of money. Oh, of course, of course. And clearly they were successful in recruiting some of the most talented uh, people and and companies mm -hmm. to be a part of their their launch. And and to be honest, I don't think the story is over yet for Quibi. Right. But um, you know, I actually think that the the story of short form is a story of failure. The story of short form is a is a failure to create an economy around an art form. Okay. Right. Like if you look at and and you know, unfortunately, right now, Quibi is just another example. Right. Right. If if you look at paintings, right, we don't judge paintings by the value of a painting by its length and and width. Right. Right. Art is not a commodity. We don't say. You know, the Mona Lisa, it's great, but it's a little small. You know, I'm not <laughs> right. sure really how important or valuable it is. We don't, you know, you probably don't know the runtime of your favorite songs. 
you know, we're not judging the value of a book by how many pages it is. And yet in the movie business, if you make a feature documentary, it's worth this. And if you make a short documentary, it's worth nothing. Gotcha. And I really think that that's one of the big things that I'm passionate about is building an economy around short documentary. I think it's an important medium. I don't think it's just a calling card for filmmakers to get started in their career. I don't think it's just, um, you know, stuff that should be for free on YouTube. I think it's a, it's an important art form. And interestingly, it's also one of the highest impact art forms for the price. So when you're a young filmmaker or you're a marginalized filmmaker, one of the easiest ways, cheapest ways to make something that's at a really high level of quality is short documentary. Right. And, you know, if if we're serious about changing the face of the film industry, we would create an economy around short documentary as the best and easiest on ramp for people who don't have huge amounts of resources, which is the number one obstacle to making films. Right. To to become known. That's the quickest way that we can find talent Uh, because everything else is a lot more complicated and a lot more expensive. And I think that might be why there's not an economy around it, because it's threatening. It's it's much better to, you know, for there to be for for the people that control the film industry. It's much better for there to be a huge financial barrier of entry than for there to be none. Gotcha. And I think the more we advocate for short documentary, the more we will see. A, a meritocracy in in talent rise in in our industry, which is which is what I want to see. Gotcha. I, I guess I meant more from the demand standpoint, from the consumer of the you know. Why do they like short? Yeah, yeah. I guess that's kind of what I meant because I definitely understand you're right because I know Quibi isn't you know you know I I guess like the fact that the demand was there is why it kind of gave birth to Quibi. Is that fair to say? I mean, barring, you know, obviously it's not doing so well now, but the fact that, you know, that short form is in high demand and how we consume it and listen to it and watch it and stuff like that, that, that kind of came from the demand that Quibi would be even in existence. Right. I guess that's kind of what I meant actually. And forgive yeah, me, I, forgive me for, for I, not framing no, no, that properly. I, I, I do think that I think Quibi came from two big recognitions. Okay. Which are which with that which are both accurate and good ideas on behalf of you know gotcha. Katzenberg and, and Whitman. Right. Number one, people are watching things on their phone. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And and number two, uh, people are watching short things, and those are both true. And unfortunately, there is a few critical errors you know made between that wise observation and the actual execution, which I think they're trying to fix. Right. But, um, I, I think, I think that's part of why short form is, um, is flourishing because people are getting most of their media on their phones. That's true, especially in pre pandemic, probably post pandemic two times. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you're getting a lot of your information on your phone and you don't want to sit there and look at your phone for two hours. Right. Fair enough. And then the other thing is our lives are full of distractions. And so it's really hard to have, it's, it, it is really hard to sign up for what a filmmaker wants us to give to a feature film or a television series because we get interrupted and we're not actually experienced what has been designed for us. Whereas with most other short form things, we can make it through five minutes, 10 minutes without interruption and we can receive the desired audience experience for that thing. One thing that I do not think is true that is often said okay. is that people's attention spans have reduced. Okay. I don't think that's true. If you look at if you look at how people are binging, you know, 20 episode Netflix series or 18 episode podcast series, that doesn't that doesn't this signal to me that yeah. attention spans have gone down. Right. I think what it I think what it does signal is that people are highly media literate, and if it's crap, they don't have time for it. That's that's fair. why you have to hook them in the first three seconds, not because they don't have a, a lengthy attention span. It's because they're experts. That's They've fair. been doing this since they were poking iPads as, as a baby. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Once again, Startup Nation, we're wrapping up uh, with Ben Proudfoot, founder of Breakwater Studio. So let's, you know, and if you want to check out uh, the website and some of these films, go to breakwaterstudios.com. We have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you listen to the replay on the podcast. So, Ben, really quickly, man, if there's a, a, a young filmmaker out there with all the tools available to them uh, now, what advice would you give them? Make stuff. Make stuff. Okay. You've got to, well, I think, I think first you got to, you have to make a decision about what your actual motivation is to become a filmmaker. Okay. And that doesn't mean convince yourself to, to do or be whoever you got to be to be a filmmaker. It means be honest with yourself about whether or not you want to be a filmmaker because you want to do that. You want to actually make the films you want to interact with actors you want to make new music you want to do the research you want to do the writing or whether or not you have an impression of what it means to be a filmmaker and you think that's cool and that's desirable and that's powerful and that's interesting and fun and you want to be steven spielberg i think you have to differentiate for yourself which what is actually motivating you, the image and the ego of being a filmmaker or the actual process of making the films. Because we need more people who want to do it and we need less people who want to be it. So that, that would be my, my advice to young filmmaker is figure out what you like to do, not who you want to be. And then once you've decided that, I would say just start making stuff. Like it is truly an iterative process. A film doesn't just come out of nowhere and appear on the screen. It comes from craft. It comes from making mistakes, learning from it, and really sharpening every time you make a film, sharpening your skills, sharpening your vision, understanding how you can get what you want to say out. And you need to just iterate that, iterate it, iterate it, and read the first third of filmmakers' biographies they're, almost all of them are a process of iteration where they where they made a ton of short films or a ton of television episodes or a ton of TV shows. Right. And you just need to get yourself into a situation, understand how and why you're motivated, where you're just making stuff all the time. And your goal is to get a little bit better every time. That's, that's the on-ramp and understand what you're motivated by. One, one thing that I am motivated by is not disappointing people who believed in me. So I, I know that about myself and I make promises to people all the time and I'm motivated by not letting them down. So just Fair figure enough. out, you know, it's maybe you're motivated by fear, you know, maybe you're motivated by praise. Maybe you're motivated by what your parents think or what your girlfriend thinks or whatever. Got you. So understand what motivates you and lean into that and uh, just keep making stuff and make it better every time. Understand what motivates you and lean into that. I appreciate that. Ben for sure and that's going to wrap up this session of the startup life Ben Proudfoot thank you so much for coming on the show and being so gracious with your time I really appreciate it my man of course so nice to, to meet you and thanks for having me no worries and as always Startup Nation if you have an idea be about that life the startup life if you want to let us know what you think about our show have an idea for a show topic or would like to advertise on our show send us a message on the startup life podcast Facebook page and while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all-new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.